Could you be worthy? You're all killers. Now, before we go on, just a note that there is bound to be some overlap between categories, with some villains being excellent foils for multiple reasons. Multidimensionality acknowledged, let's look at how villains illuminate our heroes. You know, it has always been a dream of mine to see my face reflected in your helmet as you charge at me with murderous intent. Well, not every foe a superhero faces is a physical threat. It never hurts to be in good enough shape to tackle the ones that are. But what if there is a big difference in strength or size? Of ability. The idea of David going up against Goliath may have biblical origins, but you could argue that comics and their film adaptations have gotten way more narrative mileage out of it. Villains that have some kind of physical advantage can often highlight insecurities or weaknesses of the hero. The Red Skull's grotesque visage is a stark reminder that Captain America's power lies not in the serum that gave him super strength, but in how Steve Rogers chooses to use it. The Kingpin's towering, confident frame draws attention to how small and inexperienced Miles Morales is in comparison. The trope is even smartly subverted in Unbreakable, where the villainous Elijah Glass suffers from brittle bone disease, which makes David Dunn's near invulnerability all the more impressive. But when considering how it often goes, a hero being physically outmatched by the villain, it's hard not to think about the man who broke the bat. Would break first. Bane, more than any other rogue in Christopher Nolan's Batverse, serves as a physical foil to Batman. Consider where we find Bruce at the beginning of The Dark Knight Rises. Eight years retired after stopping the Joker and hanging up his cape and cowl, his time as Batman having wrecked his body. That fall from a building with Harvey Dent didn't exactly help things either. Bruce spends his days hobbling around Wayne Manor getting robbed by the help. And you know who doesn't have to hobble around or get robbed by the help? Bane. He's in terrifyingly good shape. He's deadly as hell, and he's here to lay siege to Gotham and chew bubblegum. And he can't chew bubblegum because of the mask. The aged and battered Bruce with a robotic leg brace and a touch of hubris dons his batsuit once again, challenging Bane and paying for it dearly. And Bane's not just kicking Batman's ass. As an excommunicated member of the League of Shadows, he's doing it with the same training that Bruce got. The threat Bane poses reveals a simple truth about Batman, that he is way past his prime. Victory has defeated you. And that he needs spinal surgery. Oh, geez, not like that. Bruce spends the entire back half of Dark Knight Rises coming to terms with this fact and training his ass off so that by the time he climbs his way out of his pit prison and hitches back to Gotham, he's able to trade punches with Bane. And that guy can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with solid concrete. He may not be stronger, but he has learned that brute strength doesn't always win fights and deprives Bane of his pain-killing gas, which levels the playing field real quick. But you are worth it. I mean, after all, I am your biggest fan. Antagonists come in all shapes and sizes, and what they tell us about the hero won't necessarily have to do with the physical threat they pose. Sometimes they'll represent an emotional challenge the hero has to overcome. That shouldn't be a shock, it's safe to say most heroes have some serious baggage. Dead uncles, dead parents, and the like. The inner life of a hero can be a turbulent place, and villains often bring that chaos right out into the open. Logan has to face his violent past in his solo movie because it is literally hunting him down and trying to kill him. Peter Parker's villains have a tendency to pull at his heartstrings, constant reminders of how hard he works to keep his two lives separate. Even though they tear up Metropolis in their climactic battle, Zod really poses hard emotional truths for Clark about his place in the world. Heck, if you're Batman, Superman is both a villain and a psychological foil in Batman v Superman, making plain Batman's anxieties about defending the world from a god. Yes, heroes can have a midlife crisis, even animated ones. That's your cue, Mr. Incredible. Bob Parr has retired as the incredibly strong Mr. Incredible, choosing to raise a family after supers are banned. He's pulled back into action in a plot by Buddy Pine, out for revenge on heroes after Mr. Incredible shut down his sidekick dreams as a child. Buddy? My name is not Buddy! <laughs> Buddy now goes by Syndrome, and he plans to defeat an invincible robot of his own creation in public so that he can sell his hero tech and make real supers obsolete. And boy, is Bob Parr feeling obsolete. As much as The Incredibles is about a family coming together to save the day, it's also definitely about a middle-aged man who's coming to terms with the fact that his glory days are behind him. Syndrome favors a high-tech approach to his anti-superheroics, which serves as a constant reminder to Mr. Incredible that saving the day isn't as simple as it used to be. 
What makes Syndrome a great villain is the way his motives and modus operandi present a psychological challenge for Mr. Incredible, forcing him to face up to weaknesses that his considerable strength can't make up for. I can't lose you again! I can't. Not again. I'm not strong enough. I will bring you home, old friend. And I ask only one thing in return. Don't get in my way. But villains don't always have to be magnitude stronger or represent trauma for the hero to overcome. Sometimes villains are there to pose a question that the hero must answer, an answer which they must defend. These villains can be especially impactful in challenging a hero's preconceived notions, as heroes often have to diverge from their beliefs in order to overcome their foes. Heath Ledger's Joker certainly drove Batman to his moral edge, forcing him into impossible choice after impossible choice. Magneto's stance on mutant superiority drove him into constant conflict with Charles Xavier, who preferred coexistence to dominance. King Orm forces Arthur Curry to confront his sense of duty and responsibility to his underwater domain. Ozymandias presents a quandary to the Watchmen. Is it worth killing millions to save billions? And in the case of Black Panther, Eric Killmonger posed a challenge to T'Challa's belief that Wakanda should remain isolated from the rest of the world. Now what do you want? I want the throne. <laughs> it's about two billion people all over the world that looks like us, but their lives are a lot harder. Wakanda has the tools to liberate them all. Out for revenge on Wakanda's royal family after King T'Chaka killed his father, Killmonger devoted his life to training so that one day he could lay claim to his ancestral throne. This challenge comes at a crossroads for T'Challa, who has just been crowned king in the wake of T'Chaka's death. He's caught between governing in the mold of his recently deceased father and sharing Wakanda's gifts with the world. Killmonger's belief that Wakanda should liberate people of African descent around the world with their weapons forces T'Challa to come face to face with the consequences of Wakandan inaction on the global stage. That's all made manifest by Killmonger, a son of Wakanda who is essentially marooned in the United States and left to fend for himself after T'Chaka killed his father. Killmonger's plight makes T'Challa reconsider his beliefs about Wakanda's place in the world, and though he won't go so far as to send weapons to oppressed people around the world, he does acknowledge that Wakandan outreach can move everyone forward. Villains, at their best, don't just oppose heroes. They get underneath their skin. Whether it's exposing a fear, fault, or false belief, the most memorable antagonists always seem to give us a deeper understanding of the hero as not just a symbol, but a multi-dimensional character. What are some other examples of villains that serve as good foils to the hero? Which obvious ones did we miss? Let us know in the comments below! Thanks so much for watching and make sure to check out our other Super Movie Madness deep dives or our explainer on why Zack Snyder's Justice League isn't widescreen. And for everything else, be sure to subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.
has come a long way since Adam West's Batman was the standard bearer of superhero smackdownery. Now, the only thing holding good guys and bad guys back is the imagination of the people behind the camera. But no matter how many cities Superman demolishes, no matter how many moons Thanos tosses, one thing that remains fairly consistent is how these action sequences fit into the structure of their respective films, pushing the narrative along and looking damn good while they do it. As superhero movie madness continues here at IGN, we're going to break down how these action scenes, large and small, fit into the superhero stories these movies celebrate. Every superhero movie isn't created equal, so some movies may handle their spectacle a little differently. But when you're a studio pumping $100 million into a blockbuster, generally you're comforted by sticking to a tried and true formula. With that, let's talk about how superhero movies handle action scenes act by act. There's a lot of competition in the superhero scene, so starting things off with a bang in the first act is a great way for filmmakers to get the audience's attention and orient them as to what the heroes and villains are capable of at that point. First act action sequences also often set key plot points into motion, setting up not only the story, but also some of the broader themes that the movie's going to tackle. Think a better world than ours, girl. Tony Stark's escape from captivity with the Mark I Iron Man armor may end in pieces, but it results in Tony's return to civilization and exit from the arms race, putting him right in the way of mentor Obadiah Stane's takeover of Stark Industries. Aquaman's gladiator duel with Orm not only prevents him from becoming King of Atlantis before he's learned the humility he needs to succeed, but it also exposes his relative inexperience as an underwater fighter when compared to his enemies. X2 features a killer opening action beat that not only sets the entire story in motion, Ocean, but serves as an excellent introduction to the sequel's most consequential new mutant, Nightcrawler. After the events of X-Men, mutants have become pariahs, and having a scary blue one that can teleport all over the place show up at the White House doesn't help their case. The mysterious Nightcrawler breaks away from a tour group and bamfs his way through the West Wing, taking down Secret Service agents left and right. From an information delivery standpoint, this sequence introduces us to Nightcrawler's teleportation abilities and how he incorporates them in a fight as well as how well he's able to use that prehensile tail of his. Once Nightcrawler gets to the Oval Office, the only thing keeping him from knifing the president is a bullet to the shoulder. The assassination attempt kicks off the whole plot of the movie, which sees the government respond by sending Colonel William Stryker to raid Professor Xavier's academy and kidnap a bunch of mutants. The opening Nightcrawler sequence in X2 is the movie in microcosm, with the Secret Service standing in for the whole world as they face down a perceived foe they can neither match or understand. Of course, that xenophobia ends up being totally unfounded. Stryker was using his mutant son's mind control abilities to frame Nightcrawler and the rest of mutant kind for the president's murder. Nightcrawler's tear through the West Wing is a thrilling, economical first act action sequence that proves you don't need a ton of dialogue to set up the stakes of the story. So how about the second act? Our heroes are on their way, the villain's machinations working against them as they go. We know the mission, maybe we have a sense of what lessons or truths our protagonists need to learn. Three-act structure generally dictates that somewhere around the film's midpoint, maybe a little closer to the end of the second act, the hero needs to be humbled. Often it feels like they're at a huge disadvantage by the time the third act rolls around. Action sequences are often the vehicle by which this humble pie is served. Batman knows there's nothing that'll ground you faster than getting your back shattered by a super buff terrorist who wants to throw you in a hole to live out the rest of your days in misery. The question of just how much of himself Peter Parker will give to save New York from Doc Ock is answered when he sacrifices his body to stop a speeding train from going off the rails. Captain America realizes just how little he understands the powers he's been both serving and fighting against when he discovers his long-lost best friend Bucky Barnes has been brainwashed into being a Hydra assassin during the course of a brawl with the Winter Soldier. Of course, it isn't law that these second act action beats are all about dragging the heroes down. Wonder Woman's No Man's Land sequence occurs at the film's midpoint and sees Diana coming into her own to shred the opposition forces in Belgium. But the tradition of the heroes losing a big second act fight is well observed in Guardians of the Galaxy. After teaming up to escape the kiln and going on the run, the Guardians find themselves on nowhere trying to fence the Power Stone. Their jailbreak may have been a rousing success, but it's the second act now. You've danced, you've gotten hammered, you had yourselves a great first half of the movie, Guardians. 
maybe not you, Quill, but now the cracks in the team's fragile alliance are starting to show, and at the exact wrong time. Kree warlord Ronan the Accuser arrives on nowhere and reminds everyone what happens when the team doesn't work in tandem. Drax, Gamora, and Quill are nearly killed when Ronan makes off with the Power Stone, leaving the fledgling team battered and dispirited. Little did they know they had this to look forward to. Day. Put it together what are you together. doing? Dance off, bro! Me and you! And now we reach the third act, the big finale, the bread and butter of the superhero movie. We've seen the heroes and villains develop their powers, maybe lose them for a second, but after a movie's worth of personal development, the climactic third act battle scene sees that progress tested. After years of setup and setbacks, Avengers Endgame pays off Nick Fury's idea that a group of exceptional heroes, if assembled, could be counted on to save the world, heck, the universe. After denying that he's special, David Dunn embraces his abilities and saves a family from a madman in Unbreakable. After trashing Metropolis in a mid-air battle for the ages, the lonely Superman makes the difficult choice to kill the murderous Zod, the only other surviving Kryptonian at this point. Shazam sees Billy Batson finally give up on his search for the mother who abandoned him and accept his new family, celebrating this growth by kicking Dr. Savannah's ass with his newly superpowered foster siblings. Hell, that's broadly how both volumes of Guardians of the Galaxy end. Those are all excellent examples of climactic third act action sequences, resplendent in the mayhem and carnage we all hunger for. But while saving the world may be a worthy payoff, not every third act action beat has to level a city to make an impression. As Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse expertly demonstrates, action doesn't always mean final battle when paying off a superhero's emotional throughline. Spider-Verse may be a roller coaster of spider people, alternate dimensions, and cool animation, but what it's really about is a 13-year-old struggle to believe in himself. Working-class Brooklyn kid Miles Morales has just been accepted into the prestigious Visions Academy after winning an entrance lottery and passing an exam. Even though Miles is extremely bright, he's surrounded by peers he's afraid deserve to be there more. And once Miles gets spider powers and starts helping another universe's Peter Parker get back home, Miles' imposter syndrome takes a turn for the worse. He's having trouble getting into the swing of things, which for a budding Spider-Man is kind of a doozy. And if he wasn't insecure enough, the multiverse dumps a whole team's worth of seasoned Spider-Men, women, and pigs at his feet. Watching all these pros work makes it even harder for Miles not to focus on his failure to master his new abilities. But a superhero movie's final battle waits for no one, and Peter sidelines the rookie for his own safety. When will I know I'm ready? You won't. It's a leap of faith. That's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. That piece of advice, plus a little heartfelt encouragement from his dad about his academics, gives Miles just the spark he needs. From the top of a skyscraper, Miles hears Peter Parker in his head, reminding him that sometimes we're not sure whether we're ready to take the next step in our lives or to own our own power, whether that's in the classroom or on the battlefield. So with that, Miles takes a leap of faith. Watching Miles plummet at terminal velocity and web swing through New York with this kind of speed and grace feels like such a victory, because we know how hard Miles has worked to get to this point, how much he's struggled with the self-doubt that's been holding him back. It's the moment Miles realizes what everyone else, audience included, has known all along. He's full of potential and he's going to do great things. After that emotional payoff, the final battle in which he defeats the Kingpin, saves New York City, and sends his friends back to their dimension just feels like icing on the cake. Not bad, kid. Thanks for watching. For more superhero movie coverage, be sure to check out our other Super Movie Madness deep dives, including our video on how the villain can make a superhero movie great. For everything else, be sure to subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.
What's up, everybody? IGN Executive Editor of Commerce and proud U.S. Air Force Senior Airman Seth Macy here to break down all of the biggest announcements, trailers, and news from this year's EA Play. This is IGN's coverage of the coverage presented by USAA Insurance. USAA has served military members for nearly 100 years, and their caring representatives have your protection in mind, spending extra time paying attention to details that matter to you. USAA Insurance also makes it easy to manage claims from anywhere. But now, let's get to the news. The games don't stop coming. The July EA Play just dropped and we got an extended look at some of the games EA has on the horizon. Instead of going through all the announcements in order, I figure I'll kick things off with the biggest announcement of the show, the Dead Space remake announcement. Hell yes. This is what I'm extremely into. We only got a short teaser that was in engine, but we learned a couple of things. First, EA Motive is working on the game. It's only coming to the PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S and PC. It's built in the Frostbite engine and will be a complete remake of the original game full of those pesky alien zombies known as Necromorphs. And once again, the trailer still made use of that creepy version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Ah, that catchy little tube. We also got an extended look at Battlefield 2042's Battlefield Portal Service, which turns war into a giant sandbox. You ever wanted to see what happens when a squad of 2042 soldiers sporting modern technology face off against a legion of, I don't know, WW2 era soldiers? Or maybe you want to see what happens when you equip one side of the battlefield armed with nothing but knives and the opposing side nothing but defibrillators. Or maybe you can answer that age old question. Who would win in a fight? 30 duck sized tanks or one horse sized tank? Basically the only limit is your imagination. And rounding out the rest of the show, we got to look at Apex Legends' newest legend, Seer, as well as the announcement that ranked arenas are making their way to the game as part of the upcoming Emergence season. We also got to look at the very pretty racing game, Grid Legends, a look at the new EA original called Lost in Random that drops September 10th, and a season two update on Knockout City that adds new maps, weapons, and more to the game. And that does it for today's coverage of the coverage. What do you think of all the announcements? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, USAA makes it easy to cover your rigs and gaming gear. Make sure you've got the right coverage with USAA Insurance. Membership, eligibility, and product restrictions apply and are subject to change. Property and casualty insurance provided by United Services Automobile Association and its affiliate property and casualty insurance companies is available only to persons eligible for PNC Group membership. Each company has sole financial responsibility for its own products.
showtime. The fun doctor is in and they're prescribing 10 cc's of Comic-Con stat. Get ready for a tidal wave of trailers, a plethora of panels, a crackling Tesla coil of the biggest and latest in comics, gaming, and entertainment. It all starts right now on IGN Live Summer Entertainment Preview. No, I will not calm down. Hello, everybody, and welcome to IGN's Summer Entertainment Preview, live on IGN. I'm Max Scoville, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague and summertime entertainment cohort, Akeem Lawanson. Akeem, what's going on today? Well, you know what, Max? We got some huge reveals and panels today, plus lots of Comic-Con coverage. Among other things, we've got clips from Suicide Squad, Mortal Kombat Legends, Battle of the Realm, a look at Kevin Smith's Masters of the Universe Revelation, plus a peek at what's in store for the future of the MCU. Lots of spoilers, I'm excited. We'll also mm -hmm. be periodically checking in with IGN's resident pop culture experts to discuss all of the news and reveals and announcements coming out of IGN's summer entertainment preview. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's so much stuff. In fact, you know, while we're yammering on here, Max, tons of stuff has already happened. Let's get to that. Here to get us up to speed, please welcome Kim Horsher. How's it going, Kim? Good. There's been a lot of really cool news today that I've been excited about. First of which is a new Star Trek show. Star Trek Prodigy is being made by Nickelodeon. It's a lot of firsts for this show, actually. It's uh, the first Star Trek show aimed at kids. It's also the first time that we are focusing on people outside of Starfleet because uh, this is actually a bunch of kids who come upon a Federation ship and they're trying to figure out how to make it work. We also have Kate Mulgrew back as a hologram of Captain Janeway to help lead them there, which I find very cool. It's great to get the next, next generation, right? Now, th this, is the, this is the Troll Hunter studio, right? Uh -huh. I believe so, yeah. This is, this is gorgeous. Like if you, if you show this to me without any context, it would definitely take me until they have the enterprise for me to be like oh that's that's star trek which is it's it's kind of an interesting way to get a new audience on board you know right yeah like so yeah the the, the individuals behind this they were also behind the lego movie as well and i feel like this is a this is a great entry point for for a group of of kids like actual kids that probably aren't too familiar with uh star trek uh as a series uh to kind of like get in uh on on a new uh i guess iteration of this this storied franchise which might also get them interested in like the source material. Like the the last animated show that they ever had was back in the 70s, which was a continuation of the original Star Trek show. That so was a weird show. Nice that, that was a that, that is definitely, yeah. I yeah. feel like more for the adult <laughs> swim crowd than for current That's modern a meme day show. children. It's a weird ass <laughs> show. <laughs> uh, but speaking of like sort of weird, uh, I guess, comedic side of Star Trek, we also got news that there's gonna be uh, more Star Trek lower deck. Yeah, Star Trek Lower Decks is, I love season one. So getting into season two, we're seeing a lot of storylines continue on. We have Captain Riker back leading the Titan. It looks like Boimler is definitely still on his ship, at least for some of this season. So that is cool. We have a new Temerian security officer, Lieutenant Kayshawn, played by Carl Tart, which I'm very excited for. Again, I think this is an awesome entry point for anyone who would like to get into Star Trek and uh, you know maybe finds it intimidating. There's a lot of material to get to, so I can definitely see that. But it is an awesome franchise. Um, and if you like, let's say, Solar Opposites or Rick and Morty, the showrunner used to work on those shows, so this could help you ease into Star Trek. It is a lot, but it is worth it, I promise. I think it's it's so cool that, like, obviously Star Trek has tons and tons of lore and a huge widespread audience over various generations. And it's really awesome to see them taking so many different approaches and being, like, not afraid to, I guess, experiment, you know? Like, we've got, you know, we've got modern, serious grown-up star trek and then we've got star trek for kids and then there's a goofy comedy star trek and oh yeah uh, you know i've always been more of a star wars guy and i kind of wish that they would take some take some cues over there you know i would love like a weird you know rick and morty star wars type thing but well you know it's I not a oh star trek or star wars i think there's definitely it, I, room to love both I, it's comic-con that's that, exactly what it is that's what people have argued about <laughs> no for it's not years. they're so different max i mean this will be our new show where we yell at each other but no, that's, I, I that's think... true <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they're very different now yeah speaking of of weird fictional universes i one that has nothing to do with star wars or star trek is adventure time we got some news about that right 
Yes, we do. We are looking at the fourth episode of Adventure Time's Distant Lands coming out soon. It's called Wizard City. So last time we checked in on episode three, we looked at Finn and Jake in Together Again. But now we have key art right here for Wizard City. And um, it helps us understand it a bit more, though not very much was revealed about all of the characters, I think the character kind of doing the Akira pose right there might be named Blaine. That's all I maybe know about it. Yeah. Um, so th th this is the funny thing about that particular character, Kim, now that you bring that up, uh, like in the Akira jacket, it has a pill on it, right? And he, the pill head, right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> that's the vibe they're kind of going with that character. That could be, that could be the character Blaine that, that you mentioned. Maybe. And then um, you had some thoughts about the other character, because we do know yes. Peppermint Butler is front and center. And that this character is established as being a Peppermint and a Butler mm -hmm. and a 300-year-old occultist who knows magic. This could be the origins of that. Absolutely. Yeah. So so a lot of like as soon as this poster was dropped and it got posted on, on the Twitter, uh, fans were speculating who could that character be that's on uh, the right, because um, Kind of looks like uh, uh, an Adventure Time character named Abraka Daniel. So could be a relative, could be so, have some sort of relationship uh, to Abraka Daniel uh, is what people are speculating. There's also another character, a new character uh, that's going to be in Wizard City uh, by the name of Dr. Caladonis. Mm -hmm. Not voiced by sure. uh, Tox Ola Gondoye. She voiced uh, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Beakley on DuckTales. Oh, oh this is fair. I liked both though. shows, but I think she <laughs> may be playing the Dumbledore or mm -hmm. McGonagall analog, if I had to guess. Again, this is guessing. They did not reveal it. it yeah, I'm kind of curious the, the direction they're going to go with Wizard City, because like you would think you would have ended with Together Again, which, you know, has stars both Jake and Finn, and it explores their... Uh, it, it explores their friendship, uh, what happened after they stopped going on adventures, it Explores life and death and reincarnation. So you would think that would be the place to end. <laughs> the, also, it, it was a tearjerker too, I, I'm going to the, mention. There's so much lore for Adventure Time, which I feel like started off as like a very silly cartoon. And now it is much like all these other universes. There's just a lot to keep track of. Uh, oh, yeah. Moving on, we also got some news from uh, the, 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 the final Evangelion rebuild movie, which <laughs> already got re mm -hmm. released in some form. It is now getting re-released with new content on Amazon. It is called Evangelion. 3.0 plus 1.01 thrice upon a time. And uh, what the <laughs> hell? Equals what? What is that equal? Great title, right? <laughs> that is a lot to unpack. But um, yeah, so that's that's going to be cool. There's there's new extended scenes. Uh, Hideaki Anno was there and he, he talked about how, uh, I guess you as a, as a creator, you're never you're never done creating. And it's, I mean, I, I want him to go create some more live action Godzilla movies. But uh, yeah, so that's that's coming very soon. Uh, now we are uh, we got a we got a toss right now. Uh, up next, IGN premiere is presented by Free Guy, the next big screen action comedy movie that you can only experience in theaters on August thirteenth, starring the one and only Ryan Reynolds. We're going to take a very quick break, but first, sit back, relax, because we are about to take a very special look. Let's take a look. Is that a Glock in your pocket? No. What? It's two Glocks. Oh! IGN Live is presented by USAA Insurance and presented by Free Guy. Experience it only in theaters August 13th.
Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need, no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. Everybody loves watching a speedrun of their favorite game, but what if you got a chance to peek into the mind of the developers behind those games as they watch their hard work get completely destroyed right in front of them? What is happening right now? That's exactly what happens on every episode of Devs React to Speedruns. We invite you to ride along with the developers as they watch, react, and enjoy some of the craziest gameplay by the most skilled speedrunners on the planet. Tune in every Saturday for a brand new episode. Competition brings out the best in all of us. Well, mostly. Oh, that's a controller break. That's unfortunate. Welcome to IGN Compete, where we bring you the stories behind the esports headlines. From the triumphs, Daryl takes the game to the hardships, He's not happy. to the miracle moments that will go down in history. I just can't believe it. It's crazy. It's all here on IGN Compete. Out of disbelief. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Welcome back to IGN's Summer Entertainment Preview. Coming up next, Netflix and Kevin Smith have teamed up to put an adult spin on Masters of the Universe, and we are dying to know what that means. Will He-Man have to hijack a game show at the mall to win back Tila? Will Skeletor jam a bunch of chewing gum in the locks of Castle Grayskull on Man-at-Arms' day off when he wasn't even supposed to be there? Does Orko offer Beastman a chocolate-covered pretzel? Can Mechanek stretch any other parts of his body? Will we finally learn how Fisto got his nickname? Well, IGN sat down with Kevin Smith to hopefully ask him much better questions than I just posed. Snoochie boochies, you furry fool. Time after time, you try to take this castle, but you will never succeed, Skeletor. Call your champion. Well, we knew going in that, like, of course, the classic version of He-Man, uh, at Prince Adam and He-Man look the exact same. They just wear different outfits, and their voice <laughs> is, is virtually the same, except as He-Man, it's a little, there's a reverb on it and stuff. By the power of Grayskull. So in our incarnation, you know, we wanted him to look a little more, a little different than He-Man. We, we didn't want people to be able, able to be like, hey, like this is the same guy. So we kind of honed to the idea that Adam is young. Like Adam's uh, not a boy, but he's like, late teens or, or early 20s, who then transforms into He-Man. So more important, based on the story, as people have seen the first five episodes, more important than nailing He-Man, we needed somebody to nail Adam because Adam had a lot of screen time and Adam was saying a lot of emotional things. So instantly I thought of Chris Wood because I love Chris. I worked with him on Supergirl and stuff, but he has this innocent sounding delivery that's full of hope um that's full of belief like you know i always he played monel on supergirl but i'm like man you should have played superman i always thought he should have played fletch he's like really funny too but i knew his voice very well and i instantly i was like he would be the perfect adam no 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 what? you do not get to turn this around on me because i am the one in this situation at this moment good to see you dana that is supposed to be mad you know what i thought you'd changed so when it comes to he-man all he has to do is put on the Batman voice, right? Like essentially do a Christian Bale where here's my Bruce Wayne voice, here's my Batman voice. And, you know, he obviously didn't Christian Bale it, but he did kind of speak from the diaphragm. You know, uh, Chris is a theater kid like, like, like Melissa, they're both Broadway kids. So they know how to project, you know, from the diaphragm. So Chris was able to kind of put some beef 
into his He-Man performance, but still, of course, have it be completely recognizable as Adam. So there was definitely some thought that went into it, um, even before Chris was cast, because I was thinking like, Adam is our key. The way in is Adam, and Chris is a is a perfect Adam. Still know the tune? Some things you can never forget. So I actually didn't realize it was animated. I thought it was live action. And then I put on 95 pounds of muscle and then they were like, oh, it's it's just voiceover. So um, I just kind of used that energy. Um, ate a lot of pizza. Uh, it worked really well. I basically was Christian Bale. Um, no, it was, it was uh, for me, it was sort of finding, because it, it is two characters, but they need to be the same. And obviously, you know, I wasn't doing a whole like, cartoony, different human sounding Muppet voice. I was doing like a person. So it was gonna sound like me uh, the same. So I just I just kind of placed it differently. Um, Adam's more enthusiastic, He-Man's more classic hero. And it, it became about the chest, about uh, the fact that He-Man is literally bigger. So his voice has higher resonance. And um, once you're once you are recording, it's sort of just finding, for me, it's about finding a physical posture. Um, and remembering to talk with my hands a lot because that kind of pulls the energy out of my voice so I'm not uh, playing things for screen, which I'm used to, and uh, used to a camera being right there. So my voice tends to go more like this. So that was, that was the challenge for me, was finding ways to make things sing vocally. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, then I lost the muscle before this interview. Uh, so that you didn't have to know about it. I built a life of truth away from magic. Now you want me to save magic? Yes, to save Antonia. If I don't do this, everybody dies. No! And we're back. We just got to look at Masters of the Universe Revelation, but that is not the only animation getting shown off at Comic-Con that involves very muscular people trying to beat each other up. We also got some details on the next Dragon Ball Super movie. I'm joined once again by Akeem Lawanson, as well as IGN's Miranda Sanchez. Miranda, let's talk about Dragon Ball. Yes, absolutely. So the big news, of course, was that we got the title of the movie. So it's Dragon Ball Super Superhero. Uh, we had also a little video preview of what the animation's going to look like. And I think we'll get to some in-depth thoughts on that. Uh, but my biggest takeaway was how much they emphasized that the creator Akira Toriyama is going to be involved with this. He says, like, as the movies have come on, uh, Toriyama Sensei has been more and more involved, which is kind of a big deal because he's largely taken a step back from the mainline series. Um, so seeing that this is sort of the constant evolution of what he wants to see with Goku and friends uh, is really interesting. And I think, uh, I don't know if we want to talk about the animation in particular, because as we just saw, this little teaser was all we really got of it. Uh, but it's very different from the regular Dragon Ball style. Well, some people are a little yeah. bit a little anyway. bit weird out by the the sort of the fact that it's more it's more CG clearly, but I love that it's very it's very painterly. Like it looks like like Toriyama's old illustrations. It's got kind of like an, an inked look to it. Yeah, and, and there, there's a certain way uh, for you to like kind of marry, you know, CGI and traditional animation uh, that I think the direction that they're taking this, I, I actually think it's pretty good. Like uh, they clearly have, are taking cues from Studio Orange, uh, you know, the makers of um, B-Stars, uh, which, you know, they, they've used that technique and to just flawless degree. I personally really like where they're going with with the animation style um obviously it's different and, and as a matter of fact uh, th there was a quote uh, there was a quote that uh, toriyama uh gave to the audience which was we'll be charting through some unexplored territory in terms of the visual aesthetics to give the audience an amazing ride i want to jump on i want to jump on this ride i like the way goku was bouncing around you know i like you said that that painterly vibe i i dig it so I'm a I'm a huge fan of the manga. Like I really adore it. I love Toriyama's illustration. The anime is great and everything, but it I feel like it it almost killed him. You know, like there was so much pressure to kind of crank out new stories. And uh, you know, if you if you you know read into it, he was he was pretty pretty burnt out. But then more recently, sort of even before Super, like he's he's back working with the people making the movies and the, the new show. And it seems like he's got some some cool ideas. And he's dipping into sort of his original designs um, from the manga. They've they've actually tweaked Piccolo's design a little bit, uh, and they've. They've changed Krillin so that his eyes are 
his eyes are white on the inside. And it's, I don't know, it's, yeah. it's kind of cool to see them do that. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, I like that they gave us a preview of some of the character model uh, sheets. Um, yeah, P Piccolo, uh, for one, he looks a lot more like his uh, his manga. Uh, right now, we're, we're you know, yeah, right there, as you can see. So instead of the uh, pink patches uh, on his arms, he has, it's, it's yellow. Uh, it's a faded yellow uh, tone, uh, which is more akin to how he looks in the manga. Um, and I, I mentioned this uh, to, to you both earlier. We don't know if they're going by manga logic or anime logic because in the anime, uh, the older a Namekian gets, the pink, the pinkish hue starts to become yellow. So this obviously means that this could mean, again, if they're going by anime logic, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, Piccolo is a little bit older. And in the manga, uh, they're just black and white the whole time, unless they're on the cover. <laughs> um, but no, we also got we, a minute there. We saw, we saw Krillin's, uh, I guess, his new... His, his new uniform, which has a cool, nice. cool helmet. Yeah, his eyes look good. Uh, yeah. I don't know how I feel about I Krillin wearing those Netflix. pants. They're very tight yeah. pants for Krillin. They're very <laughs> tight, but it's a dope outfit. I uh, honestly, I, I would actually cosplay this this outfit. I, I really dig it. I was gonna say, this is very yeah. stylish. You have the larger jacket on top, the tight pants <laughs> contrasted nicely with the boots that are larger as well. So it, it's a good, it's a good fit. Yeah, can, can we just say, yeah, Krillin is like the hippest cop ever like i mean like what what police officer dresses like this i mean he looks so dope it's probably the strongest two on the force uh now we also got a glimpse of uh pan um I, I don't know if we have that right there she is so there she is in her kindergarten uh Aww. uniform which means if she's in kindergarten uh which is what they said uh in the panel that means that at least what three to four years uh have passed so uh, since uh the tournament of power arc um, and this is where that, uh, I know Max, you were mentioning this earlier, that this is where that, uh, I guess that theory came from uh, on the internet that's been circulating. Uh, it's It's been based on just this image alone and the fact that she's clearly in her kindergarten, uh, well, they said she's in her kindergarten outfit. Uh, this movie, uh, uh, by the way, they kept saying this too. I don't know if y'all caught this. This is apparently gonna be, he, he's, uh, Tor Toriyama has invested a lot of time into this one and it's probably gonna be the best Dragon Ball movie yet. I mean, of course and they're going to say that. that. It's the I'm new, say, it's the new so. one. I yeah. believe it. <laughs> what about, I believe it. What about Tree of Might or Bojack? Those are good. I like the Dead what? Zone. They're they're all good. They're good. <laughs> Except listen, Max, it, they wouldn't Bio say Broly. things that aren't true, right? The, I mean, like the the fact that Toriyama was working on this while they were in production of Broly, that tells me that there was some idea uh, that that he had that was that he just really wanted to get out, and he knew he couldn't get it out. Uh, in what they were currently producing. So he wanted to make a, I, I don't know if it's a continuation or if it's, you know, obviously we don't know where in the timeline, we're, we're assuming that this falls yeah, after yeah. Um, well, the Tournament of Power. I'm so, I'm dying to know more. I think it's gonna be awesome. Uh, obviously it's still pretty early on, um, but you know, we should see that pretty soon. Uh, speaking of animated things that involve people beating the crap out of each other, there's a lot of those. Mortal Kombat <laughs> Legends Battle of the Realm is an all new animated movie coming out at the end of next month. But if you can't wait that long, we have an exclusive clip to show you right now. And yes, that is clip spelled with a K. Check it out. Give up now. The two of you can't hope to defeat Shao Kahn's army. Two? Uh, who said anything about two? Did you say two? Nope. Well, I didn't say two. If it was just two of us, well. I mean, that would be stupid. Crazy, even. Lord Raiden, the chosen one. Oh, great. Now I'm getting second billing. Shall we? We shall. Still on the wrong side? I don't have much of a choice. And if you did? That is a brand new clip from Mortal Kombat Legends Battle of the Realms, which is the follow-up to last year's Scorpion's Revenge. And if you didn't get a chance to see that yet, you got plenty of time to catch up because Battle of the Realms hits Blu-ray and digital on August 31st. Now, cartoons about people beating each other up is all very well and good, but what if you took a bunch of drawings and didn't turn them into a cartoon, but turned them into an idea for a live-action movie about people trying to beat each other up and used human actors 
and a computer animated shark. Well, that's exactly what Suicide Squad is. And here's an exclusive clip, so check it out and stick around. There is plenty more IGN Summer Entertainment preview still to come. Zero two two seven is wide open. Colonel dispatched the detachable kid. TDK two o'clock. TDK is the detachable kid. IGN Live is presented by Free Guy. Experience it only in theaters August 13th and by USAA Insurance. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, Let's Plays and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. Everybody loves watching a speed run of their favorite game, but what if you got a chance to peek into the mind of the developers behind those games as they watch their hard work get completely destroyed right in front of them? What is happening right now? That's exactly what happens on every episode of Devs React to Speedruns. We invite you to ride along with the developers as they watch, react, and enjoy some of the craziest gameplay by the most skilled speedrunners on the planet. Tune in every Saturday for a brand new episode. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's new show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Due to the pandemic, movie theaters closed and many big releases were pushed to this year, 2021. Now here joining me and Max to discuss some of the biggest movies and TV of the year so far is IGN's very own entertainment guru, Jim Vavita. How's it going, Jim? How you guys doing? Good to see you. Yes, uh, now I gotta tell you, you know, Max and I, we've seen a select few of some of the biggest titles this year. So I figured, you know, you'd obviously be the go-to person uh, to give us some insight. Uh, starting with uh, the most fun movie slash TV show of 2021. What do you got, Jim? All right. My personal favorite most fun is In the Heights. Um, I, I just, I loved it. I got to see it last year when it was supposed to come out. So I had to sit on my reaction to it for a year. And I couldn't wait to tell people just how joyous and life affirming the movie was. So that's hands down my favorite most fun movie of the year. Uh, in terms of the TV stuff, I, I got to go with WandaVision because it was so different for the MCU and so um, particular, you know, and peculiar. So I was like, that those two were my favorites in terms of fun. Yeah, In the Heights. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I got to tell you, Jim, I never would have picked you for a musical guy, but I mean, that, that's ah. a great, it's a great <laughs> choice. Uh, Max, what do you have? I was, I was really happy with Mortal Kombat. I think I had pretty low expectations going in, but in terms of just like pure stupid energetic fun like i just got i turned into like a third grader watching that again to jim's point i thought wandavision was really cool i thought it was really interesting how that was the 
that was how Marvel decided to kick off the Disney Plus shows. Like that is a really bold move for the first three episodes to be black and white sitcoms. Like to come out of Endgame and then go into Leave It to Beaver is like definitely a very, very <laughs> bold choice. But uh, yeah, definitely the most fun I've had watching a show about grief. There's that. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I agree with you on 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 uh, the point of Mortal Kombat. Like, I, I went in with low expectations, wasn't really expecting it to be that much. Kano uh, in that movie was kind of, I would say he was like the standout character in that film. Um, and they really, you know, th there's, they did a nice job of setting up potential for a sequel, uh, which hopefully will get Johnny Cage, I don't know, busting out like one of those split punch to the nuts. Uh, but for me, I have to say, uh, movie-wise, uh, Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead uh, was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's it's a movie about like a bank heist that takes place in, in the middle of a, the zombie apocalypse. The bank heist element, you can put that to the side. That was just a plot device to kind of put them in in this this area overrun by advanced zombies. That's the thing that I like the most. The fact that they had advanced zombies that had hierarchies. There was like a king and a queen and they had a bartering system with the zombies if you wanted to enter their territory. I thought that was so much fun and a great uh, take on the zombie genre. Uh, for TV, I have to say another uh, Marvel entry, uh, MODOK. Uh, that really surprised me. I thought it was just going to be, you know, your regular, like, run-of-the-mill, I would say family guy type clone. But it actually surprised me with how deep they kind of went uh, with that one. Uh, of course, like everyone knows MODOK, he's an evil villain and he's trying to take over the world. But he's also balancing his family life. There's an overarching narrative as with most Marvel television shows and movies and it honestly made me kind of feel for the the big head I, little I keep guy to check that out. But I feel like a lot of people are sleeping on that because so mm -hmm. much attention has been paid to the Disney Plus stuff. But that's I mean, that's Pat Oswalt. Like, he's so good at that. Yeah. And it's the the robot chicken uh, studio. I, I yeah. feel like that's just like Pat Oswalt's character in Young Adult is probably the most accurate representation of a toy collector in, in <laughs> movie history. So I, I have a lot of respect for him, even if that was just a role. But. Now, mo moving along, picks for movies slash TV shows worth the wait. Jim, let me start with you again. Uh, I think in, it's kind of a toss up for me. Like um, F9, even though I knew exactly what I was going to be getting, to finally just get the movie was great. Um, that was great fun, especially seeing it with an audience. Um, I will also say, though, like Black Widow, finally just getting the yep. MCU back was just a, a small miracle, really. Uh, it had been two years since Endgame. And uh, I'm glad we had the Disney Plus shows um, in the meantime. And WandaVision was worth the wait because Falcon and the Winter Soldier was supposed to go first, but the pandemic uh, tripped up their production. So WandaVision took the slot. And I think they ended up being, the, the to Max's earlier point, the strongest way to start uh, the Disney Plus MCU. So big screen, F9, mixed big screen TV, Black Widow, and then TV, WandaVision. I don't know if this is worth the wait, but the Friends reunion was like, I was really curious as to what that was going to be like. And I kind of went in cold. And I think I was expecting an episode or something a little more scripted, but they had this, it was a bizarre variety show. They had Justin Bieber doing like a like a runway model sketch. Really weird. And it was also just like, I mean, I feel like there's that, oh, what's, what are the Friends cast? Like, what have they been doing for 21 years? And it's like, well, four of them were getting plastic surgery and <laughs> all of them weren't hanging out with each other because it was their job to play Friends on TV. And I think it was this kind of like, you know, like I, I, I saw it. I'm like, you know, what? I'm cool. They don't need to resurrect friends. They don't need to bring that back. Like, I'm kind of happy I saw it. You know, I, I think Matt LeBlanc is is great. I love that he had the whole like Irish uncle meme thing going on. But like, yeah, yeah I, was, I, I was definitely the longest wait. Another group of friends, the super friends, uh, you know, Zack Snyder's <laughs> Justice League. Uh, you know, like we finally, we finally got it. You know, like we've been F just waiting. I mean, it took a pandemic for this to happen, but, you know, it was well worth the wait. I know a lot of people complain about, you know, well, not a lot of people, but I know I have friends that are casual uh, viewers of of these superhero films. They're like, dude, I'm not going to sit there for four hours. Well, this movie ain't for you. OK, relax. It's for us. You know, people that that are willing. Like I sat through the entire four hours. I didn't get up for anything. You know, it was a very it was like a nice Chicago style deep dish pizza. And he's for, he's from the Midwest. So, you know, he he gets that reference. I feel like that one definitely takes the cake for me or 
I don't know, pizza, whatever. I don't know. The pie. I, I, the, the, the pie. pie. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, the pie. I mean, I would argue that it definitely has some deep dish stuff going on and that you might fall asleep in the middle of it. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> I, saw, I saw it in, I want to say, one sitting. In my defense, I had a newborn, and it was very much in that. I, I thought this was, it was going to take me six days to get through. It took me like an afternoon. I basically mm-hmm. took an intermission and took a nap and then got up and was like, what are they, what, what's Aquaman doing? And, you know, <laughs> it was, I, I guess it was much it was much more watchable than I was expecting. Like, I think he's very much known for doing these very grim, dark, slow motion, uh, you know, drawn out bits, but like it, it was definitely a better movie than the, the Joss Whedon one. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now uh, we're running out of time. So let's do this last category really quick. Jim, I'm going to start with you again. Pick for best movie of the year. That's tough because we're, you know, we still haven't gotten a lot of the big ones, but I'm probably going to go back to my, my In the Heights. That was my pick for best movie of last year when it was supposed to come out. I think it's so life affirming and so joyous. And it just, it's a, a movie for after all the terrible stuff that we've all been through mm-hmm. that this movie comes along and just makes you love life. And so I think for that reason alone and its artistic execution, it's my pick so far. We, we'll see what the rest of the year holds. How about you, Max? Um, this is kind of a, you know, out of left field, but Barb and Star and Vista Del Mar was, <laughs> I, I went in completely cold to that. Like some, my, a friend was like, have you seen it yet? And I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, I haven't seen ads for it. I haven't heard people talking about it. I'll check it out. And I went in completely blind and had an absolute blast. Please. And uh, yeah. Godzilla versus Kong was also fun as hell. I, I mean, I feel oh, like yeah. it's it's hard for me to say like this is the best movie of the year because I don't want to say Mortal Kombat's the best movie of the year. It's not, but I don't know what is. Like I don't have an answer to that question. It's a weird year for movies, you know. It, it really is, and and honestly, like like Jim said, the year isn't over. Uh, for for me, I'm you know I wanted to laugh this year because we all know how much of a dumpster fire last year was. So uh, for me, I'd have to say Eric Andre's Bad Trip. That one, uh, probably just like for you, Max, Bar- with Barb and Star, that one came out in left field for me. Like, I, I just went in not really expecting much. I wasn't expecting essentially what it was that we got, which is, you know, a, you know, uh, obviously Eric Andre's brand of comedy. Uh, I don't know how they were. They were able to successfully stitch together a cohesive narrative uh, through actual pranks and uh, on unsuspecting people. I don't know. It, it reminded me of uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's films, uh, which we got last year. We got Borat too. Uh, only I feel like this one had a little bit more cool factor because when Eric Andre, you know, runs around naked, it just looks cooler than <laughs> seeing Sasha Baron Cohen. In my opinion, my weird, admittedly weird opinion. That's no, just I, that's just me. I feel like the Eric Andre ceiling for weirdness is like. I'll do respect to Borat, but like Sasha Baron Cohen has like a pretty airtight. Like here's the here's the thesis. Whereas like Eric Andre's like. We're going we're gonna to trip balls in a supermarket. Like, it definitely yeah. goes way, way further. Well, thank you so much, Max and Jim, for joining us. Well, you know what? That's what we got for this year so far. Some of our favorites. What are some of your favorite movie and TV shows in 2021? Let us know in the comments. The Disney Plus Loki series set some major events into motion for the future of the MCU. And up next, a live edition of Cannon Fodder is talking about the future of the Marvel movies and multiverses. But first, we need to take a quick break. We'll be right back. IGN Live is presented by USAA Insurance and presented by Free Guy. Experience it only in theaters August 13th. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, Let's Plays and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need, no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel, DC, Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's new show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? 
we're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. What's up everyone, Sydney here to bring you a little update about the future of IGN on YouTube. We've been listening to your feedback and it seems like some of you are more into games while others are more interested in movies and TV. So we got to thinking about it and decided, why not both? Our main channel will still bring you all the biggest news, reviews, previews, and trailers to keep you up to speed on the most important highlights. But if you only want games content 24 seven, head over to IGN Games. Movies and TV more your thing? Check out IGN Movies and TV. More channels, more of the stuff you love, more IGN. Welcome back, True Believers. The MCU Phase 4 is well underway, and boy, things are really starting to get good and weird. We get lots of stuff brewing in the background. We've got new villains just waiting in the wings. There are new superhero teams very slowly assembling, and then there's that little wrinkle that this cinematic universe is about to turn into a cinematic multiverse. So where does this all go from here? Well, joining me to break it all down and hypothesize a bunch of crazy theories, I'm joined by Joshua Yale, senior editor and producer and resident comics expert here at IGN, and social media coordinator Lauren Galloway, who's also one of our MCU conspiracy wingnuts. Thank you both for being here. Yay. Now, <laughs> wingnut chiming in. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it, that's, I think that's a fair term for it. That's probably also like a really D-list Avenger that showed up in the Silver Age at some point. Uh, but before we dive deep into all this, what we expect to see in phase four, uh, we have to warn you, we are about to do a whole lot of speculating on what the future holds. And if we're right, that could be an accidental spoiler. We know about as much as you do, so just maybe more because we pay close attention, but we're just going off what's publicly out there. But if you're trying to avoid any kind of spoilers, now would be the time to bail out when we get into it because there will be no holds barred with spoilers. Okay, so the MCU seems to have a few major storylines going, but the biggest one right now is easily the friggin' multiverse, which is actually technically a bunch of simultaneous storylines itself. So let's start with the end of Loki season one and Kang the Conqueror. Joshua, where is this going? Where is this going? You know, well, he said a very interesting phrase to me, which was that, that you know, based on what happened, his death, it will reignite the multiversal war. And to me, as a longtime comic book reader, I heard Secret Wars, right? Which is this big mashup where heroes and villains from all over the place come together. In fact, the modern Secret Wars was a patchwork planet that was made from all the different Marvel realities, and they were uh, put on one world that was ruled by Doctor Doom, and all these you know crazy big epic battles happen, and then out of that they rewrote. Marvel reality and then folded things into it from all these different realities that they liked. So to me, that says that might be how the X-Men come to the MCU. And as we all know, every theory, no matter where it starts, has to end with the X-Men. So there. I mean, to me, my X-Men, I'm all for it. Lauren, what do you think? <laughs> where, where, I guess more importantly, uh, when when is Kang the Conqueror headed? What are, where, where is this going to where is this going to show up? It's interesting because when Loki got back to the TVA, Mobius did not recognize him. So clearly his journey back in time, uh, things have already started to change and, and, trans and, and take place in the Marvel Universe, even before Loki got back there. And obviously we saw that very formidable uh, statue of Kang the Conqueror when he got back. So I'm hoping that we get Doctor Doom, that we get the X-Men, that we get all these, like Joshua was saying, these kind of patchwork and, and things that, that we've seen in other films and other universes. I hope they collide through this universe. And Kang, he's formidable. The he who shall, like he who remains was obviously terrified of him. So we are heading to a multiverse of madness, which, which we knew was coming. But I think um, that final episode of Loki really solidified that's where we're going. Now, the weird thing is, before we get Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, we have a few other things happening. We've got, before that, we've got uh, Shang-Chi, which is, I mm -hmm. think, in, what, September, August, something like that? And then, and then in November, we've got the Eternals, and then there's Spider-Man No Way Home, which is right around Christmas. So, And we know that Doctor Strange is showing up in that, So, and there's also rumors about other spiders, men, Spider-Mans, whatever the plural is, showing up in there. So it seems like we're really... <laughs> Spider-people. Yeah, right? We're kind of setting up a whole multiverse. And then we know for sure that Kang the Conqueror is going to be showing up in Ant-Man and the Wasp, 
Quantumania, which isn't out until February 2023. But I mean, time is all relative. So uh, it's it's exciting. Which of these are you most excited to see first, Joshua? I mean, can anything beat the hype that's going on for Spider-Man No Way Home? Where They haven't even released a trailer yet. The movie comes out pretty soon, um, and everyone is, is losing their minds over just the, the mere possibility of seeing Tom Holland's MCU Spider-Man being joined by Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and Andrew Garfield, uh, along with all those other supporting you know, villain characters, which just sounds like big and epic and awesome. I thought it would be a long time before we got something on the scale and hype of Endgame, which was this big crossover. But just this singular spider crossover sounds like it may be just as big, just as hype. I don't know. Something I'm really happy about is I remember they dropped the trailer for Far From Home uh, before we knew what was going on in Endgame, which was sort of, it kind of, it, I feel like it spoiled a little bit and it definitely kind of like, I feel like that was kind of Sony trying to jump the gun on, on Marvel. But I, if this time around, if they want to, you know, keep it hush hush and under wraps uh, until, you know, much closer to things actually happening, I'm all in to be totally surprised by uh, No Way Home. Uh, Lauren, what are you looking forward to the most? I'm excited about Doctor Strange too. I think uh, having Wanda and Doctor Strange play off of each other is going to be fascinating. I think America Chavez is lined up to be in that film. And for anyone who's familiar with her powers, she can punch portals into other worlds and other dimensions. And so I think it's going to be great to get Marvel team ups the way we used to have them with Avengers characters. Now we're going to get them with uh, mystical powered characters, characters who can open portals, characters like Wanda. I'm, I'm excited to see how all of these magical and mystical characters play off of each other. And yeah, I, I would like to see the spider people come together for No Way Home. I think that will be the biggest thing to happen so far in the MCU outside of what happened in Endgame. <laughs> Now, the weird thing here is is before we get all that, obviously we want to see familiar returning characters. We've got kind of two debuts. We've got Shang-Chi and we've got the Eternals who are, I think in terms of sort of, uh, you know, Marvel characters, like, you know, relatively unknown to sort of general moviegoers. Uh, and obviously this is this is how they hook you. You want to find out what happens next. So you go check out this this new stuff. But what's, what's really odd is that like, be, you know, we've gotten like Loki just exploded the cinematic universe. It's now a multiverse. We don't know when or in which reality anything is taking place in. So it's going to be really interesting to sort of see when these take place and when they're set. Uh, Joshua, do you have any any sort of theories about chronologically where these are going to align? Um, uh, no, thanks for throwing me the hardest question uh, possible. Though I don't know, like I think I think it's still going to all take place in what we would consider the sacred timeline. You know, mm. there's that one steady timeline that where all everything in the MCU has happened so far. And I think if something is going to be taking place in a weird a branch reality, we'll know about it. I don't think they're gonna try and confuse us with that. In fact, I think they're gonna limit exploring that just not to confuse more general audiences and frankly me. Uh, and and, and they're gonna, all those kind of crazy weird things are gonna take place in the what if cartoon, which is essentially showing like, well, what could be going on in all of those branch realities. Now, the, there's one thing we did see in the, in the Shang-Chi trailer, which was Abomination who pops up, who we haven't seen since the, the Incredible Hulk movie that nobody talks about because is it canon? I don't know, sort of, kind of, you know, it exists in its own weird little side thing, but that would definitely go a long way to be like, oh, we've just, we've got a different Hulk timeline where he's Edward Norton, not Mark, not Mark Ruffalo, and, you know, Abomination leaps through a portal, something like that. I mean, it's, 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 a lot of people pointed this out, but like the multiverse is a great way to kind of have a, a loophole or a wormhole or a time portal or whatever between sort of different intellectual properties. Uh, so that's, that's fun to see, but um, I'm definitely dying to know what happens. These are obviously, you know, kind of very, very large scale movies, but um, we've also gotten, uh, you know, we've gotten some teases of a much more grounded thing that's going on. Uh, moving on from the multiverse, uh, the MCU seems to be building on whatever is going on with uh, Contessa, Valentina, Allegra, De Fontaine, who we should probably just call Val for short. She now has super soldier John Walker on her roster and she's got a Black Widow on her payroll, a Black Widow. I guess there's, there's numerous of them at this point. What team do we think she's building here, Lauren? I want to call them the anti-Avengers, and I know that's not necessarily a canon term or a technical term, but it feels like Valentina is is playing the role that Nick Fury played in Phase 1, 2, and 3, but she's playing a much darker version of it. We know that she's out recruiting heroes that don't necessarily have a problem painting in the gray, and whether it's the Thunderbolts, I know that that, that title has been floating around. I'm not quite sure if that's the exact direction that the MCU is going, but she's definitely recruiting people who maybe were filling in the gap that the Avengers left during the snap. And I'm very curious to see 
if any of them, especially Yelena, are going to figure out that she's not necessarily a good guy. And if at some point she's going to turn on Val. Joshua, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there, Lauren. Uh, it's got to be, you know, the Thunderbolts, which for those at home who maybe haven't heard of them, it's like Marvel's version of the Suicide Squad, right? It's like where they recruit criminals and sort of more uh, dark leaning characters to for uh, like a government sponsored team. Uh, and then it could be uh, the anti Avengers uh, in the comics. We call them the dark Avengers, mm -hmm. right? It, there was an era in the comic books called dark rain where Norman Osborn took over the Marvel universe, like successfully good for him. Uh, finally he did it. Um, and had a uh, team of like imposter Avengers who were secretly villains, you know, like bullseye was pretending to be Hawkeye and, and so on. And so it looks like that's what's happening now. You know, yeah, we have us agent who's the captain America fill in and we have Yelena who's going to be the black widow fill in. You know, we did just see, as you mentioned, Matt, the return of abomination with weird fin ears now comic book accurate weird fin ears um and uh, he could be the team's hulk maybe that's why they brought him back so she could you know val you know contessa could scoop him up and join have him join the team so yeah i definitely think the marvel universe is heading in a dark direction uh, we're going to pivot really quickly here and go to you our wonderful audience uh, our social community social media coordinator lauren who's right here, uh, put out the word on Twitter, asking what you think the MCU is doing with the multiverse and Val's new team. Let's go to the first response from Angel Amaral. Three things I need to see after watching the Loki finale. Let the multiversal war begin. I need to see Spider-Verse. Next, I would love to see Loki in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Lastly, an army of Kangs across the entire multiverse, whether it's live action or the animated universes. I think that would be so freaking cool. Imagine an army of Kangs versus an army of Spider-Man. I have nerd chills. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> that was a really good pitch. Uh, but yeah, that is the the awesome thing that comic book fans know to expect from Kang is that he's not just one guy. As you know, people who watch the Loki finale now know there's you know an infinite number of Kangs across the timeline. And in the comic books, he even has like the the Council of Kangs. You know, from him from you know, from ancient Egypt and from the far future and all these different versions, they sit there and argue with each other of how they're gonna like take over the, the time stream and foil the Avengers one more time. Uh, it's kind of like the Council of Ricks, if you know, for the Rick and Morty <laughs> fans out there. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely something to look forward to. Lauren, what about you? Yeah, I think seeing more of Kang is, is definitely what everyone is looking forward to. Um, just watching the Loki finale and watching everyone's reactions on Twitter was the highlight of my week. I think people were just so impressed by Jonathan Major's performance and the fact that he's not just going to play one version of Kang, but he is going to play these multiple versions of Kang, I think is exciting. That's definitely going to be really fun. I, the one thing I was, I was skeptical about there is, is the idea of, of uh, an army of, of spiders, spiders, peoples running around. Cause I feel like there's that weird kind of uh, shaky relationship between, you know, Disney and Spider-Man and Marvel or Sony and all that. And you know, it, like, we're going to see, you know, Spider-Man's going to show up, but like, I feel like if they're going to have a big multiversal fight, it's going to be, you know, over in the, the Sony movie. I mean, we already got a, you know, a Spider-Verse movie. We're getting another one too. Uh, anyway, here is our next great response from Sari Moscato, who brings up a very good point. Well, I think the MCU phase four is just saying, heck it all, and we're just going to be able to do whatever we want, like use variants and different versions of characters and like maybe things that may or may not be considered canon anymore. <laughs> and with Contessa, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what's going on there. She is bringing together Hawkeye's dog Lucky and Yelena's dog Fanny to start the Pet Avengers, and that's where that's going. Yeah, it's not it's not the worst idea. That I kind of I'm kind of into it. <laughs> See, I, I'm a huge Agents of Shield fan, so I'm totally on board with this. Well, I mean, that's I, th that goes into what I just said about like you know you've got you've got some characters who exist maybe in sort of you know weird you know shaky jurisdiction of who owns the rights, and if like maybe I don't know you want to have Venom show up in a movie, it's like well I just you rip a hole in the fabric of the cinematic multiverse and just borrow Venom for a movie or two. You know, it's like, it, and if you want to have a spinoff uh, Pet Avengers movie, why not? That sounds like a Disney Plus show if there ever was one. The we did just explains all of that. We did just get Throg, a little Throg cameo. So That's Pet true. Avengers, you know, they are assembling. Yeah, we've been we, we've been watching yeah. the Young Avengers, but it's the Pet Avengers. Yeah. Great, great observation. Give me like a like a superhero Milo and Otis, but with less cruelty and more superpowers. That sounds like a good time to me. Uh, now let's see what else. What else we got here? Um, 
Our next one is from Josh Schmidt. Let's see what he said. As the MCU moves into the multiverse, it gives them the opportunity to build upon and get creative with the source material. They have future-proofed themselves with the ability to modify and change characters as they see fit. Having variants of each character offer so much more possibility. Personally, I'm ready for a Spider-Ham, Alligator Loki team up. Okay, we're, we're on the same page there. Also, like, Josh, you coming for our jobs? Like, what is that? So that's like an audition tape right there. Yeah, that was, that was actually pretty nice. Pretty well done. Yeah, it seems like uh, so there's something like with the Pet Avengers is in the air. People want the animal characters, Marvel. <laughs> Hope you're listening. Well, Joshua, who's um, Hawkeye's dog from the the Hawkeye run? Um, Lucky. Yeah. Lucky. See? And he's, and he's got one eye. Oh. <laughs> We're already going to get it in the Disney Plus show, so it's yeah, happening. It's happening. <laughs> I want the I want the Matt Fraction Hawkeye in the movie. Like I've never been a Jeremy Renner fan. I feel like he's too much of a dad, you know. Like I kind of want the one who's running like a he's kind of like a Brooklyn slumlord who's trying to put it together. There's that issue where he has to call up Tony Stark to help him put in his HD HD TV. Like that's I like that. I like that I Hawkeye. I think we're that's... gonna get that in the Disney Plus show if you know you've seen any spoilers, which I won't say. All right, all right. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, but, it's um, just that the Hawkeye we have in the MCU is like a family man. Like he's past that point, you know, of, of the of the fraction uh, David Aja era true. comic book run. But I'm sure as Marvel likes to do, they'll just marry in the best elements, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the beauty of of a multiverse. Again, it's like there are no rules anymore. It's there's an infinite Spider Mans, and, and nobody has the rights to anyone because every, all the superheroes <laughs> are free. It's gonna we're gonna I mean we're gonna have a, a what is it amalgam comics crossovers. It's gonna be dark claw and dr strange fate do you guys remember that yeah the dc marvel crossover that's i feel like that is just like a legal just a legal time bomb at this point nobody wants to touch that <laughs> and that is it for us today thank you for joining our little cannon fodder live together and our ign live summer entertainment preview but we are not done yet Join us tomorrow when we'll be talking to M. Night Shyamalan about his brand new movie, Old, taking a look ahead at all of the biggest movies of 2021, and we're doing another very special episode of Cannon Fodder, but this one is all about what's in store for the future of Star Wars, plus tons more. We will see you right back here tomorrow, same time, same channel, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch. Have a good night, everybody. IGN Live is presented by Free Guy. Experience it only in theaters August 13th and by USAA Insurance. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. In a world with non-stop news about Marvel DC Star Wars, you need a show with accurate reporting, hard-hitting commentary, and... Me, Akeem Lawanson, host of IGN's news show, The Fix Entertainment. Whether it's the latest superhero scoop, film fiasco, or anime announcement, I'll be here covering all the breaking movie, TV, and streaming news that matters most to you. Make sure to catch The Fix Entertainment on IGN for your fix of entertainment news. Let's drop it. Competition brings out the best in all of us. Well, mostly. Oh, that's a controller break. That's unfortunate. Welcome to IGN Compete, where we bring you the stories behind the esports headlines. From the triumphs, Carol takes the game to the hardships, He's not happy. to the miracle moments that will go down in history. I just can't believe it. It's crazy. It's all here on IGN Compete. God, I'm in disbelief.